So let's start with what is an alignment algorithm. Very quick one slide introduction. So you have, you have the genome that you're sequencing, let's call it the subject's genome. And you have the reference genome, which is quite close, but not quite the same as the subject's genome. You're sequencing this, the subject's genome, so you're drawing reads from the genome at the top. By the time those reads come out of the sequencer, you've already lost the association between these reads and the subject sequence. So all you have is a set of reads sitting in a file. And you now need to get back the information on where did they originally come from. So you use the reference sequence for that. So you map these reads back to the reference sequence. That tells you where they came from potentially in the original subject's genome. Note that the reference genome is not quite the same as the subject genome, but it's close enough. It has a few, what are shown in red here, a few mismatches and deletions and insertions, which is what makes the problem of alignment uh, a little more tricky. So that's the problem of alignment. You've got to take reads that came from one genome and map them to a relatively similar genome. What issues must an alignment algorithm consider? The first is, of course, mismatches and gaps. Here you have the reference genome and the reads, and you can see that the alignment has had to introduce gaps because there's potentially a deletion in the subject's genome relative to the reference genome. Or there could be mutations, maybe single point mutations, maybe multi-point mutations. So it's clear that one of the things that an alignment algorithm must consider is the ability to introduce gaps and mismatches while matching reads to the reference. The second issue is that of handling paired reads. Uh, let me illustrate how paired reads are used. So suppose you get not a single read from the subject genome, but a pair of reads which are at an expected, known expected distance, let's say 200 uh, base pairs apart. When you try to map this entire pair as a unit, it's quite possible that one of the reads falls in a repeat region, let's say the blue read falls in a repeat region. And the repeat region, there are two instances of the repeat region in your picture. If you were just to map the blue read, then you would not know whether it falls in the first instance of the repeat region or the second instance. But if you were to map the whole pair, so the blue and the green together, the green falls outside the repeat region, so it's in a unique region, so it will map in only one place. It won't match in the second place here. The blue will match in both places, but the fact that the blue and the green have to be a certain expected distance of each other ensures that you discard this mapping and retain only this one. So this notion of handling paired reads is another important thing that an aligner must handle. And it must also be able to then handle the fact that these paired reads are, although an expected, are ought to be at an expected distance from each other, they could be much further away or much closer or on different chromosomes or out of alignment, etc. Flagging all of those things is important from the perspective of identifying structural variants further down the line. The third thing is handling a variety of read lengths. A few years ago, the next generation sequencing was restricted to maybe read lengths of size 30 and thereabouts. But in the last couple of years, almost all the read lengths that are being generated, the minimum I've seen is 50 and the maximum is can go up to a thousand, maybe a few hundreds to a thousand. For short reads, which are about length 50, you want only a few mismatches and gaps. As the reads get longer, you need to handle many more mismatches and gaps. And in particular, you need to handle gaps as reads get longer. So for instance, the earliest aligners that came out, Bowtie does not handle gaps, even though the recent release of Bowtie 2, which does handle gaps. The uh, BWA aligner works best when there are few gaps that it must handle, and as the read length grows longer and longer, and you need to introduce more and more gaps, BWA slows down. So there's another version called BWA SW that is more preferable when you have longer reads, etc. So there are often different strategies that people use for short reads and longer reads, and uh, slightly different algorithms. But any aligner must be able to handle a variety of these read lengths. And finally, the speed and memory considerations. So often you're aligning tens of millions of reads to billions of reads. You'd like to, of course, run as fast as possible, which means you need to use the multi-core enabled. If there are multiple cores or multiple processors on your machine, you should be able to use all of those. You should be able to run in some reasonable amount of RAM, let's say four gigabytes of RAM. However, one might argue that what is important with an alignment algorithm is not how fast it runs or whether it can run in a certain amount of memory, but how sensitive it is, etc. So what an alignment algorithm ideally should be able to do is to scale. So if you have four gigabytes of memory, it should still run. If you have 32 gigabytes of memory, 
it should be able to scale speed and accuracy for memory. So if I have more memory, I should be able to run more accurately with greater speed. If I have lesser memory, I'll still be able to run. So these are all the requirements of an alignment algorithm, and we've tried to meet a lot of these in our design of Cobweb. I'll give you a brief introduction, couple of slides on how alignment algorithms typically work, what are the core ideas that go behind an alignment algorithm, and then we'll describe how Cobweb works. So the core issue that an alignment algorithm faces is that of indexing the genome. So let me describe what that means. So you've, here you've got the reference, this green long string is the reference. For every read, you've got to figure out where it came from in the reference. One way to do that is to scan the reference. So you take the read and go to every point in the reference and ask, did this read come from this point in the reference? For a particular read and scanning across a 3 billion length reference, is going to be slow, and then when you magnify that over a billion reads or tens of millions of reads, that will be extremely slow. So you cannot afford to take each read and scan the entire reference. What is the next best thing that can be done? The next best thing is that you create an index out of the reference. Much like if you have to look up words, the meaning of a word, you create an index and we call that a dictionary. You put all the words in a certain sorted order so that when you have a new word to look up, you can very quickly look up that word. You don't need to scan through the list of all the words. Likewise, you can take the genome and the reference and create an index out of it. The goal of this index is that it very quickly yields locations in the reference where some part of the read matches. So by some part of the read matches, I mean there is a part of the read, let's call that the seed, it matches exactly without any mismatches or gaps. The seed could be the whole read or it could be part of the read, but the point is that the reference allows you to check whether the whole read or a part of the read matches without any mismatches or gaps very quickly. It will allow you to do that in time that's proportional to just the read length and largely independent of the length of the reference sequence. So in other words, you're just looking at the read and pretty much deciding where all in the reference does a good chunk of the read match as opposed to looking through the entire reference. And that's what a reference index enables. So what I mean by a seed is that if, if this is your read, the, the bar in gray, then this reference index will quickly allow you to say, here is a chunk, a yellow chunk seed in the read that matches at reference locations x1, x2, and so on. And here is another seed that matches exactly at reference locations x3, x4, and so on. So you get a very quick list of reference locations where parts of the read match exactly. And that's enabled by this notion of a reference index. Now, once you have that information, so once you have a seed that matches, so you have a read and a yellow seed, a part of the, uh, of the read that matches exactly in the reference, then you need to ask how many mismatches and gaps are needed for the read to match around the seed at this location in the reference. And that can be done using standard bioinformatics. It's called the smith waterman algorithm or the dynamic programming algorithm. So you take this read, you have an anchor seed, and now you do a smith waterman type algorithm to look around it and see how many mismatches and gaps do I need to make the whole read match here. And if the number of mismatches and gaps is too many, then you don't output uh, a match. And if it's within the limit specified, then you say that the read matches at this location. So that's the two-step procedure that typically um, an alignment algorithm would use. It would first use an index to narrow down where to do more intensive looking for each read, and that index will allow you to usually get a seed match anchor. And then around those seed matches, you would do more intense um, Smith-Waterman type algorithms. One of the indices that, is, that have become quite common, uh, quite popular for a number of reasons which I'll describe is called the Burroughs-Wheeler Index. And uh, it's useful to know, know a few words about this Burroughs-Wheeler Index. So, I've illustrated it with an example here. So imagine this is your original reference sequence. I mean, it's just four or five bases long here, but in, in reality, it's three billion, but I've given an example with about you know, four bases with a special symbol added, added to the end for convenience, a dollar symbol added to the end. So you have a reference sequence, which is just CGAC, let's say, and then you take all of its, what are called circular shifts, so you start at let's say C, and then you take the whole string, then you start at G and then walk along the whole string, so you would get the string G, A, C, dollar C. Then you start at A and walk all around, and then you start at C and walk all around. So you get about five different circular shifts of the string, and you sort them much like you would sort them in a dictionary. You sort them based on the alphabetical values, so 
all the strings beginning with A come first, then the things beginning with G C come next, and then those beginning with G and so on. And these are your indices. You remember that this was the second, this string started at the second location in the reference. This one started at the beginning of the reference. This one started at the third location in the reference and so on. And interestingly, the last column of this table is called the BWT and it has some very interesting properties um, which I won't go into. Uh, but essentially the BW index says that if you just keep this array out here and you keep this column out here along with a few other housekeeping data structures, then that serves as a very good index and what I mean by good, I'll describe next. Essentially, this index is, will allow you to very quickly find seed matches, number one. Number two is that this index, you can decide how much space you want to keep to store this index. So you can sample this index to fit it into, if you have only four gigabytes of memory, you can sample this index so that it fits into four gigabytes, but your running time will be a little higher. If you have 32 gigabytes, you can sample it such that it happily fits into 32 gigabytes and your running time is much faster. So this index has a nice property that you can decide how much to sample this index at and store. So if you store it highly sampled, meaning the sample size is very small, it will fit into memory, but it will be on the, the running time will go down. If you sample is less, meaning that you store a lot in memory, then your running time will correspondingly go up. So that's the beauty about this index. And how the index is typically used is that it will allow you to determine all exact matches of a read. So without any mismatches or gaps, it will allow you to determine all exact matches of a given read in the reference in time that's proportional to just the length of the read and completely independent of the length of the reference or largely independent. So you could have a 3 billion length reference, but to take a particular read and figure out where it matches exactly in the reference, if any, it'll you just need to spend time that's proportional to the read, which is let's say 50 or 100 base, you know, bases, and completely independent of the 3 billion bases that the reference is made of. So that's the beauty of the BW index. So with that introduction, let me quickly describe how Cobweb works. So essentially, the Cobweb uses the two-step process. It finds seed matches of a read, and um, then it extends it using the Smith-Waterman type algorithm. Um, as I mentioned, the core idea of the PW index is that it will allow, allow you to determine whether the whole read matches exactly in the genome. Now, we are interested in finding places in the, gen in the reference where the whole read may not match, but a part of the read matches, and then you can introduce mismatches and gaps to make the whole read match. How do you use the BW index to find matches where it's not the whole read that's matching the reference, but part of the read is matching? So we use the BW index augmented with a few additional data structures that we have come up with for speed to find one or more long seed matches in the reference. So, so here I've given an example. So for instance, we might find that here is a stretch of length 15 that matches exactly in the reference at locations x1 and x2. Here is another stretch of length 15 that matches at locations x3 and x4. And here is a long stretch of length 30 that matches at location x5 in the reference. So we are able to go through the read and very quickly identify long seed stretches that match in the reference and where do they match in the reference. Um, the fact that we can identify these long seed stretches allows us to then focus on a few locations to do Smith-Waterman type uh, intensive analysis. The justification for finding you know, these long seed matches is that if you look at here as an example I've given, these are reads aligned to the reference and wherever you see a little bar out here, these are the mismatches and gaps that have been introduced. And you can see that in most cases, you'll see that the read has a pretty long stretch that matches exactly. And it's not that even if there are many mismatches and gaps, it's not that they're strewn uniformly across the read. They'll all be, there'll be a few in one corner, a few in another corner. And typically, you'll be able to find at least one long stretch, maybe of 15, 20, 30, 40, that will match exactly in the reference. And that's the seed that we find using the BW structure. The advantage of finding these long seeds is that one you know, long seed will have few matching locations, so there are few candidates around which you have to do more uh, intensive processing. And the second is that as read lengths go up, chances are you'll get longer and longer stretches matching. So you don't need to fix a seed length a priori. You don't need to say, I'm going to find a seed of length 15. 
you will find a seed if there's a long seed you will find it if there's a short seed you will find it so it's very adaptive and it can adapt to the read length so that's the key advantage the seed length is not specified in advance so long and short reads can both be handled seamlessly unlike you know bw bwa and bwa sw where you need two different algorithms to together handle the long and short read spectrum here you have one algorithm that will automatically handle the notion of a uh, long or short read because it adaptively finds a seed of a long enough length and then separating out the smith waterman stage from the bw index search allows us to basically specify any number of gaps and mismatches that you want and we can handle an unlimited number of gaps and mismatches of course as you add more gaps and mismatches the time grows but it grows sort of linearly not exponentially in the number of gaps and mismatches bwa for instance if you add a lot of mismatches and gaps it will get slower and slower quite exponentially and that's why bwa sw was introduced so that those are the advantages of cobweb that there's a single algorithm that uh, scales from one end to the other seamlessly how does cobweb compare to other algorithms we are still going through quite a lot of intensive comparisons and we'll put that out in about 15 days time as a white paper or so but i just wanted to give you a brief glimpse of some numbers and essentially as i said cobweb can handle both short and long reads and here we've given two examples one length 50 one length 150 even though there are a lot of numbers on this slide i'll i'll focus on a few but if you want the takeaway message it's a little faster than bwa and it gives comparable results as bwa so for instance let's focus on this line here these are reads of length 150 we've allowed for a 94% alignment score which means up to 6% mismatches and up to two gaps and bwa allows for 4% error our parameters for running bwa is 4% error plus one gap of possibly multiple length and if you look at the timings our timings are slightly better than bwa the number of unaligned reads they are slightly lower than bwa in this case in some cases they'll be slightly higher but pretty comparable all of these parameters are very very you know comparable so we'll be putting out more detailed comparisons on synthetic data sets and real data sets with bwa with bwa sw and with botai in the next few days but this is just a glimpse and the take away message as i said is we'll gain a little bit on time maybe 10 to 20% on time compared to bwa and the results are pretty comparable to bwa in some cases slightly better in some cases a little worse how is cobweb exposed in avadis ngs i'll walk you through the workflow on how you would align data in avadis ngs as you are aware at the moment in avadis ngs 1.2.3 which is the version that's currently in the market we allow for only bam or sam files meaning already aligned pre aligned files to be imported in our sngs 1.3 we are allowing you to import fastq raw fastq files and align those so when you create a new experiment you will see in the drop down two additional options they are called the dna alignment option and the small rna alignment option the dna alignment option will allow you to align reads against the dna and you'll use that both for dna variant detection experiments as well as for chip seek experiments so in both cases you want to align to the dna so you'll use the dna alignment option and if you're doing small rna analysis you would use the small rna alignment option so once you create either a dna alignment experiment or a small rna alignment experiment the fastq file so you provide a fastq file and that gets imported in there's a special new workflow associated with this experiment which comprises these steps so we have expanded the the range of qc st- steps that you can do there are a few more plots including what was significantly missing in 1.2.3 you can there are now plots to see the base quality and the read quality distributions as well as to look at the base compositions the atgc compositions across bases in a read and once you've satisfied yourself that the reads are good you actually run alignment using this workflow step i'll go through the dialog the what parameters are specifiable in the next couple of slides once you run the alignment you can view post alignment results how did the mapping qualities and the alignment score plots look like if you're doing targeted region analysis let's say specific target enrichment analysis you can right away do there's a special new step we have included that's called target region qc that will allow you to identify for every one of your targeted regions 
what was the coverage, GC content, etc., in that region. So once you satisfied yourself that the alignment went well, then is when you decide you can create either a DNA variant analysis experiment or a ChIP-seq experiment. And then it creates a new experiment with these samples, and then you're back in the world that you're already familiar with in analyzing downstream for DNA variants and for uh, you know, ChIP-seq uh, promoter binding and histone methylation sites. So let's go into the run alignment dialog. What are the alignment parameters that we ask for? So we ask for an alignment score. What is the minimum alignment score that you want to allow? So the lower the minimum alignment score, the more the number of mismatches and gaps that you allow. You can actually explicitly specify the minimum number of mismatches or you can just specify an alignment score. And you, we also ask you for how many gaps you want to allow. We may change this to be a percentage, a fraction of the read length rather than a fixed number as is seen at this point, but you'll have some measure of allowing how many gaps you want to allow. Then the output parameters, often there are reads that will match in multiple locations. You'll be asked how many do you want to map to keep just a unique match. If there are many matches of roughly the same quality, roughly the same alignment score, would you want to just keep all of them or you want to keep any one of them or you want to keep you know, the top three or top five? And if there are too many matches, do you want to just ignore these reads and not because you're just not sure too many matches with good alignment score, then you're just not sure where this read came from and do you want to just ignore that read. So that's the step two of the alignment dialog. Step three allows you to specify trimming parameters. The most common step would be quality trimming. You can trim from the three prime end if the quality is low, which often happens in most platforms that the quality at the three prime end of the read goes down and there may be more errors at that end. So you can, you can specify a quality cutoff here and trim based on that. This will show up eventually if you're used to the Avada's genome browser, it will show up as soft clipping or hard clipping sorts of um, indicators in the genome browser. You can also do fixed trimming if you want. Sometimes you know that the first three bases are bad. If you look, there are uh, the pre-alignment quality views that we output will sometimes tell you that the first three bases there is a problem in the first three bases, the quality is dimmed and then it's fine. So you can choose to just trim off the first three bases if you want to. And for small RNA analysis, we have this adapter trimming step. And this is available only for small RNA alignment because small RNA is, reads have adapters at the end that you need to remove before you align to active small RNA regions. So you can specify the adapter that was used in your experiment here and th that adapter will be then trimmed off and we allow a small number of mismatches in the adapter that you can specify. And then finally, the last step is screening against contaminant databases. If you have RNA databases or any other sequence databases that you can treat as contaminants, then you can upload them into Avadis NGS and use those to screen against. So any read that matches these contaminants will not be considered for screening against the intended reference genome. So that's how you would use alignment in Avadis NGS. So you have to import in fast few files, you have to run alignment, and you have to then create a DNA variant experiment or a ChIP-seq experiment. Or if you chose small RNA uh, analysis, then you, you have to do small RNA alignment, followed by create a small RNA experiment, and then do all the downstream analysis in that new experiment. In terms of the future evolution of COBWEB, there are a number of things that we are looking at in the near future. One, particularly RNA-seq alignment. Once we introduce that in the next few months, I think we will be complete from the perspective of offering to our users a complete analysis package that they can come in with raw reads for all of our workflows and do everything within our NGS. People are looking at structural variants. We will extend our algorithm to handle chimeric reads, so where part of a read maps in one place and part maps somewhere else far away. The, our algorithm is eminently suited and easily extensible for this. It's just a matter of doing it in the next few months. We'll be adding base quality recalibration to compute empirical base qualities as part of the alignment and also allowing for affine base costs, so having a different gap opening and gap extension penalty. As of now, it's just the same penalty that we're using. So these are the things that we see happening in the near future. With that, I come to the end of this webinar. Thank you.